Welcome to all of you to the third and last lecture. Third and last Adorno lecture uh, within the year 2022. Uh, my name is Stefan Lesnik, I'm the director of the Institut für Sozialforschung. And before really starting, I want to take the opportunity to thank at least selectively some people of the staff of the IFS who have made this event possible. Uh, I want to do this in the beginning because in the end all too often it is forgotten. Uh, so um, first of all and most prominently I want to thank Eva Fleischmann who was in charge of the whole organization um, in the last months of this event. Um, would you please show up shortly and you get your applause. And she did that in cooperation with Almut Popek Popinga, who sits next to her. Um, <laughs> and for the technical and organizational support, I want to thank publicly Mirko Groll, Miriam Schröder, uh, Georg Marx, who's not here at the moment, and Saskia Benitz. Thank you. And, and finally, as a cooperation partner of the Institute, I want to thank, to the, thank Lena Hauptner, who designs the posters and flyers for these lectures. And, uh, by the way, who designed the new website of the Institute. Please visit it. Um, and for all of you who have not been here yesterday or the day before, I would will shortly summarize. Um, I asked Linda if it was okay summarizing yesterday, and it was. Uh, she's so friendly, she says it was. Um, and I will shortly summarize what she did say on Wednesday and yesterday. In her first talk back on Wednesday, Linda Martin Alcott made the case for understanding races and racial identities as historical formations. Historical events have brought into existence racialized identity formations in terms of ways of being, habits of action, and forms of life. They are not simply the products of policy, but of practices, actions, relationships, and experiences that have shaped subjectivity, perception, and judgment across generations. In the second lecture yesterday, Linda Althoff called for taking racism out of the individualist frame. Racism is a certain way to evaluate ways of being and living, and it implies a normative ranking of cultures that is then used to justify exclusion, displacement, forced assimilation, and other forms of violence. The analytical suggestion is thus to use the lens of cultural racism, understood as a way of seeing and knowing, the roots of which should be dated back to the very beginning of the conquest of the Americas. Not surprisingly then, Linda Alcoff referred intensively to writers from the Americas who point to the long colonial and not less neo-colonial history of ideas developed to justify a hierarchy of cultures. Cultural racism even today garnering wide public support for the exclusion of immigrants and refugees. Cultural racism remains useful to protect the ill-gotten gains of the colonizing powers around the world. We should reject the idea, however, that all forms of racism can be generalized into one, and remain alert, remember the historical formation pieces, and remain alert to new forms of racism yet unimagined. And we should be aware of the fact that the colonial matrix of power cannot make sense of the current push against Western dominance or of the ecological critique of cognitive racism. De-Westernization challenges the West at the epistemic level of its signifying system. It means that the West must engage in, that was the end of the talk, must engage in dialogic engagement and processes of transculturation rather than assume, as has been done through centuries, a universal, a universal stance of unilateral judgment. But, to be sure, for the mainstream culture, 
and the cultural mainstream in Western societies, de-Westernization is utterly unintelligible, feeling like chaos, anarchy, and violence. Linda Alcott's third talk tonight will be devoted to the crises of white identity. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. On May 14th of this year, just about six weeks ago, 13 people were shot in the city of Buffalo, New York, while doing their Saturday grocery shopping. 10 died, ranging in ages from 32 to 86. All were black. As he rampaged through the low-priced, tops-friendly market grocery store, the murderer, Peyton Gendron, apologized to some white people he had shot, explaining that he had shot them accidentally. Gendron is 18 years old and white and had driven several hours to Buffalo from another part of the state after spending several months purchasing body armor and other tactical gear along with a military-style AR-15 rifle, and researching potential target areas. He live-streamed the murders on social media. We could tell this story in multiple ways, focusing on the murderer's youth, his gender, his rural upbringing, his religion, his use of social media, his ability to access semi-automatic weapons despite an earlier incident of antisocial behavior that triggered a psychiatric evaluation. But the one aspect that we could not set aside from any account of the story is his self-identification as white. This fact is relevant to some of the other aspects of the story I just listed, such as his ability to purchase weapons despite his troubles in school. But Gindran himself foregrounded race in a 180-page manifesto that he posted online shortly before the murders, expressing his desire to reestablish the United States as a white Christian nation. In this manifesto, he expressed his hatred of Jews, Mexicans, and Asian Americans, as well as African Americans, making reference to well-known stereotypes. And like the murderer of Mexicans in El Paso, the murderer of Muslims in Christ Church, New Zealand, Gendron referred to the great replacement theory. It was his intention to do his part to combat the effort of non-white, non-Christian people to replace him and his people. The problem is growing. In the United States today, a recent survey reports that one-third of the white population accepts some version of the replacement theory, coined by Renaud Camus. This theory is circulated without censure on so many varied online platforms that journalists are beginning to call it part of the new mainstream. Despite variations, all forms of the replacement theory target non-white immigration, and all claim that replacement is an existential threat to national continuance. The conservative journalist Tucker Carlson began using this theory explicitly in September of 2021, arguing that immigration policies currently in place in the United States will, quote, change the racial mix of this country. He goes on to say that, quote, in political terms, this policy is called the Great Replacement, the replacement of legacy Americans with more obedient people from faraway countries, unquote. And Carlson calls this a suicidal path that will destroy the country. The theory is an important force in several current political conflicts in US society today, most obviously including immigration, but it's also relevant to our problem with gun sales and with abortion rights. Uh, a, can uh, um, 
Congresswoman um, gave a speech just two day, days ago thanking the Supreme Court for protecting white life. The replacement theory may feel too obviously wrong, too easily discredited to merit theoretical analysis. In this talk, however, I want to argue that it is key to making sense of the crisis of white identity. The replacement theory is a claim not just about nationalities or ethnicities, but about racialized groupings or groups designated by a racial concept. Some conservative groups in the United States try to portray their concerns as nationalist or Christian rather than focused on race. And so white nationalists were barred from attending the most recent Conservative Political Action Committee conference. Tucker Carlson, for example, used the term legacy Americans, though he also refers to the change of the racial mix of the country. But the term American itself used in the conservative media is often a code that refers to those whose lineage can be traced to Europe. Tonight, I want to take the replacement theory as an accurate representation of the beliefs and affective state shared among large numbers of white people in many parts of the world. The real question is, why has there been so little response by liberals and progressives? My response will take up where I left off in the talk on cultural racism yesterday, since, as I'll argue, the replacement theory moves between race and culture and nationality to argue that the West is about to be destroyed. So I'm going to draw some of the threads of the previous talks together tonight to discuss First, what do we mean when we talk about white identity? And second, how, do we understand, how should we understand the current crisis? And then I'll, I'll give um, a response. So first, what do we mean when we talk about white identity? We have to emphasize again that whiteness is local. Who is included changes as well as the connotations enlivened by the term. But despite its variations, we can also note that white, whiteness is quite distinct from other racialized categories of identity and that it poses particular problems when we try to include it in a pluricultural social amalgamation. Whiteness has been associated with superiority. Its political rights, immigration rights, and economic opportunities have been protected by numerous states, so that some believe whiteness without such associations and protections loses its meaningfulness as a form of identity. Barbara Applebaum, for example, argues that whiteness is something we do, not something we are. And if we stop doing it, we can move away from having whiteness be a part of our identity. So on her view, whiteness cannot survive the reforms we might want to make of its meaning and significance. I would be happy as the next person to cease and desist using the category. But the question is how to stop doing whiteness and whether the simple refusal to self-identify really means that the identity is no longer in play. There's a structural scaffolding of white advantage that affects our everyday interactions in airports, at job interviews, in school, encounters with police, even on Tinder, whether we want it or not. Whiteness has a particularly long history of effectively concealing its power and influence while controlling outcomes in its favor. Toni Morrison called this playing in the dark. This feature of whiteness is the primary motivation behind critical race theory, to bring whiteness into the light of day in its formative effect on juridical interpretation, for example. Whiteness is only a single feature of our identities, but the constitutive nature of intersectionality means that it interacts 
with all aspects of our socially recognized identities to alter their meaning and their effects. So our racial identity interacts with ethnicity, gender, class, and nationality in the social imaginary of expected norms of behavior, likely skills, likely dispositions. We imagine white, male, working class people who live in rural areas differently than we imagine white female professionals living in cities. The significance of whiteness may rise or fall depending on context, but it remains a critical feature to include in our self-understandings. It is notice, notable, as I uh, mentioned last night, that blackness is today the term of choice of the Black Lives Matter movement that united over 50 organizations to launch new anti-racist social organizing over the last decade. The term black is distinct in meaning from the term African American. It signifies a grouping of people that are all subject to hatred, fear, and violence because of their visible features, no matter their nationality or lineage. And in this movement, it's clear that blackness is not treated by activists only as a form of victimization, but as a political subjectivity with epistemic salience. This is why it is considered critical for black people to be in charge of the movement, to be writing, documenting, filming, developing strategies and organizational forms, and setting out the acceptable tactics. So blackness has an objective reality, but it's also a form of subjectivity with associated epistemic content and orientation, as well as affect. Affect constantly comes up in reference to representations of racism and suffering. How will the problem be represented? By whom and for what purpose? Today, we are witnessing across the United States a new era of cross-racial solidarity. About 65% of the population supports Black Lives Matter right now. Majorities of white, Latinx, and Asian Americans populations support Black Lives Matter. How does class figure here? Uh, one of the um, good surveys that, that was reported by the New York Times of the upsurge in 2020 indicated that the white protesters um, since the lynching of George Floyd are mostly middle class and college educated. Why is this? I think the answer has two parts. First, we can give credit to Africana studies, Latin American studies, and other such curricular developments in higher education as well as high schools. The population of college-educated youth is not as ignorant about historical realities as my generation was. We, my, I'm talking about my generation, had to sort of do our reading on the side since Du Bois was never assigned in class. Second, however, we also need to acknowledge that the liberal and most of the radical intelligentsia have abandoned the white poor and workers to the right wing. They are considered the true deplorables beyond redemption. I want to argue here that this negative and even fatalistic assessment is the result of focusing on attitudinal issues over social position or economic position. In the United States, in fact, liberals and progressives and segments of the left write off rural communities and majority white counties because they think in terms of short-term election cycles. But what they are doing is abandoning huge swaths of the United States to white nationalists and to Christian nationalists. So given that we must, for a time, talk about white identity, how do we go about it? Too often when we talk about whiteness, we may be referring to different things. The concept has multiple meanings and uses, and whiteness is as an emotionally loaded, volatile topic as they come, enlivening even in casual conversations a tempo of pain, fear, even rage. We need to find a space to unpack the concept 
consider its complexities, and reflect on the sources of our pain, our fear, and our rage. And though our fears are different, in this hour, I'm including all of us, white and non-white. I find it helpful to unpack the talk and the scholarship about whiteness into three categories. We can call these the empirical, the imaginary, and the subjective. These three dimensions have distinct reference. Empirical whiteness is what we're talking about when we're talking about wages and wealth, housing and health care, voting patterns, and also history. We can now map whiteness, measure it, locate it, and date it. We can establish the median real estate values in white majority neighborhoods and compare those to other neighborhoods. We can find its fertility rate and its mortality rate, its employment patterns, its rate of incarceration, and compare these to other groups. Empirical whiteness is a measurable object in the world, but again, its parameters will be local since the definition of whiteness captures different groups in different locations. In some countries, such as France, such empirical metrics are hard to obtain since the state has shied away from collecting such data. Yet clever demographers are finding a way. Besides surnames that can be used to identify North Africans, for example, the presence of sickle cell anemia in a given neighborhood is used as a proxy for black identity so that researchers and racists can make rough predictions about the racial demographics of a given area. It would be easier if the state collected the data, but the worry is that racial concepts will appear more real, more stable, if they are used to identify populations by the state. And you know this is a well-motivated worry, but this has not led to less racism in material distributions or in the ideation of who the true or paradigmatic Frenchmen are. I heard a talk by a leading French demographer a few weeks ago who was saying that the white French are really concerned because the Muslims don't eat cheese. That's the <laughs> quintessential criteria. So this brings us to the second dimension of whiteness, its meaning in the cultural or collective imaginary its power as an ideology. Imaginary whiteness comes in both explicit and implicit forms. There are explicit ideologies of white supremacy galore, but there are also background frames that invoke whiteness with more subtlety to place white sensibilities and white lives at the center. Imaginary whiteness can make whiteness the defining, controlling term even when it nowhere appears. This can make the work of dialogue and negotiation very difficult, not simply because interlocutors have different perspectives or opinions, but because some can see the background assumptions more clearly than others. The result of empirical realities and powerful imaginaries is to produce a form of subjectivity marked by whiteness. This is the third category. This, too, has now been empirically measured primarily by social psychologists such as Claude Steele, the former director of the Center for Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. Steele and his colleagues have designed experiments over the last several decades that reveal a distinct content to white subjectivity, not universal to all whites, but still statistically significant. This content includes different ways of interacting with non-whites verbally and non-verbally, and problematic perceptual assessments such as significantly overestimating how many non-white people are in a room. When forced to interact for significant periods of time with non-white strangers, whites have been shown to exhibit cognitive deterioration such, a, such as a reduced ability to perform simple math tests, indicating that the cross-racial interaction has been cognitively taxing. Whites tend not to hold eye contact with non-white people, to stand further away, to be tense, and to self 
to, and self-conscious and to assume, perhaps rightfully, that conversations will be uncomfortable. As phenomenologist Shannon Sullivan argues, there are clear patterns of hostility exhibited by whites toward non-whites. There are also patterns of behavior that indicate assumptions of entitlement to space, to resources, to attention, and to protection. And one of the points Sullivan makes is if you wonder how this, how racism gets passed down through the generations, even when there's no overt statements told from parents to children, the children pick up on the body language, right? They pick up on the fear and the tension, and this is the way it gets passed down. So whiteness is real. It serves as a predictor. It's also varied, and it's also subject to change. Opinion polls in the U.S. show marked differences over a generation in white attitudes and beliefs about the persistence of racism in society, including in key institutions such as schools and prisons. Polls also show marked changes in attitudes toward interracial marriage. But as we know, progress is neither inevitable nor stable. My approach is concerned not just with the ideational contours of whiteness as a concept, nor only with the manifestation of a white supremacist politics that lays behind forms of governmentality as well as our normative political ideals. I argue we also need to bring actual white people into the picture, their lived experience and subjectivity. So that's the point of separating out the three elements, the empirical, which is historical, economic, the subject formation, and the imaginary of whiteness. And I think those of us who are in the humanities, such as myself, are often solely concerned with the imaginary of whiteness and the ideology of white supremacists, while people in, in sociology and the social sciences focus on the empirical. And some of this reveals aspects of the subject formation of whiteness. But we need, obviously, an interdisciplinary account that can connect these various approaches. So whiteness is not monolithic. It runs from Trump Towers, these are luxury apartments, to trailer parks, from liberal city snobs to rural militias, from gay and trans to women and children. Straight white men can be low wage workers, mistreated prisoners, and economic conscripts in imperial wars. These differences of experience within the category yield extreme conflicts of interest over economic and social issues. The much discussed political polarization in the United States today, the, which is what we call the red state, blue state division, is in reality a division among whites over, for example, how to assess the significance of racism and what should be done about economic inequality. So in other words, the, the most significant social conflict tearing our societies apart are white against white. White nationalists often vent their greatest anger at the apostates in their midst, the white traitors. Many of us have learned this. It is wishful to thinking to believe that the political divide runs parallel to class. We must remember that white working class in the United States is no longer much of a protected category. Their economic situation has significantly worsened since the 1970s. Mortality is, is worse now, drug abuse is significantly worse, and there have been disproportionate white deaths, interestingly, in the US military actions in Iraq and Afghanistan, quite different from Vietnam. We might imagine both economic and cultural reasons for, for this. The white grouping who continues to have the greatest protection are elites of the professional managerial classes who are protected from losing the value of their stocks, protected from military service, protected from having to send their children to more highly integrated schools, and also protected from the deterioration of the poorer areas of cities that they can avoid. This and motivations. The most significant indicators that predicted Trump supporters in 2016 was not class, but whether one 
lived in a rural area, whether one is male, whether one belonged to a labor union, and whether one has gone to college. These distinctions, I'd suggest, track experiences of interaction more than they do class. Urban life makes it difficult to live cloistered in racially homogeneous spaces. Integrated schools, public transportation, and workplaces are more familiar to white workers in cities. And union membership creates, at least some of the time, real opportunities for participating in collective decision making that involves people from diverse backgrounds. Note that what I just listed concerns more working class people than the upper middle class who can live and work and send their children to schools in more rarefied spaces with less diversity even in cities. Class is without a doubt a critical element in the political disaffection and fears that drive conservative nationalism. But its role is complex. Again, to reference Sullivan, who, by the way, is a white Texan, we must guard against the tendency, the desire to locate racism among the poor and outside of elite institutions, that is, outside of power. So, part two, given this account of whiteness, how should we understand the current crisis of white reaction? The crisis across North America and Europe today is fueled by the language offered by the replacement theory. But what fuels the replacement theory? It's not simple mistaken belief in the concept of race. More relevant, I want to argue, are long-standing ideas about group-based rights which are themselves based not on political theory, but on versions of group history. It is the narratives of history that generate a sense of rightful belonging and legitimate exclusions. The replacement theory, I'll argue, has been fueled by a certain narrative of white entitlements to land and to power. In this way, entitlements are tied to lineage, to longevity, in a location, what Carlson called legacy. White identity then, whether in North America or in Europe, provides the grounds of political and economic entitlement. So let's begin with the replacement theory itself. The great replacement theory is generally credited to Renaud Camus' book, Le Changement du Peuple, that came out in 2011. The book argues that global elites are conspiring to replace white Christian populations in Europe with minorities. Camus' European focus was primarily on Muslims, a group that is expected to expand significantly over the next century to become the majority in Europe. In the United States, the adherents of this theory focus on non-whites in general, but particularly African Americans and, and Latinos. Camus' theory is only one articulation of a general theory of what's sometimes called white genocide that often portrays a Jewish global elite as the brains behind the conspiracy in alliance with non-Christian non-whites. And this is a replay of, of claims that were made during the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s that the struggle to end segregation was being orchestrated by Jews in which black people were simply the frontline soldiers following orders. This theory lacks logic or factual evidence, but it nonetheless connects with a sense of precarity some whites feel as their lives and livelihoods change. And it provides language, a narrative, that offers both explanation and solution. Camus, for example, calls non-whites who reside in Europe colonizers and conquerors and occupiers, thus suggesting their intention to dominate and making it clear that they're not where they belong. Belonging in these lands is restricted. One of the charges that conservatives often make against liberals is that liberals don't care about belonging. In other words, they offer nothing to replace the lost sense of belonging some are experiencing today. So I want to suggest the replacement theory has the following five elements that make it particularly influential and triggering. <clears throat> 
First, it is a call to return to a prior era, a quest to go back. Nostalgia is evoked here for a period when societies had less violence, when neighbors were friendly, when we did not have to lock our doors at night, and when young men could have a reasonable expectation of a job with a pension. This nostalgia can be criticized on many grounds, and this is important to do, but I'd suggest we also consider some of the constructive desires that are expressed in this romantic conception of the past, the desire for community, for economic stability, for trust in institutions, and for peace. The desire for belonging that is manifest in the desire for community is not illegitimate. Second, for societies built historically through settler colonialism, such as in the Americas, Australia, and New Zealand, the determination to thwart replacement means this is a call to defend the settlements. The history of all settler societies is replete with wars, both small and large, against local indigenous populations. In some cases, those local populations were vanquished relatively recently, such as the Mexican population who were overtaken in 1848 when the United States won the Mexican-American War and incorporated half of Mexico into the United States. The Mexican population in these western areas of the continent were promised full citizenship and the ability to maintain their property rights. They were denied these rights and became themselves a subject group forced into low-wage labor whose land and property was confiscated. Thus, the struggle to achieve political equality and economic justice for Mexican Americans has been going on for more than a century and a half. Clearly, the settlements that the replacement theory wants to protect have a racial component. All settler societies, from Australia to the United States, have crafted laws and institutions to favor designated settlers rather than all who share the space or all who have worked to achieve settlements, that is, the agriculture and industry. Third, the replacement theory assumes an identity-based power as a legitimate feature of political institutions. In other words, it's not using a concept of the abstract individual as its basic unit of rights, but a concept of a particular group with a particular history. When power is rooted in this identity group, then loss of majority status is an inevitable loss of power. Within electoral politics, this means that race motivates one's political orientation and interests. Michael Omi and Howard Winant refer to racial projects as follows. They say, a racial project is simultaneously an interpretation, representation, or explanation of racial dynamics and an effort to reorganize and redistribute resources along particular racial lines. So adherence of the replacement theory imputes immigration to be a racial project to which they're simply responding with their own racial project. Fourthly, the replacement theory offers an explicit identity politics meant to contest the identity politics they believe is at play among liberals and the left. If non-white groups are to receive educational and employment help based on their racial identities, then white groups should organize as whites to advance their group interests, they say. It is white identity politics more than white populations themselves that is in danger of replacement. Thus, as Christina Beltran argues, what is actually being displaced are not white people, but the power and status of whiteness. My fifth point is a caveat or qualification. If the replacement theory references identity-based rights to land and political power, the way in which these group identities are defined is subject to some variation. In the United States, settlers or legacy Americans can sometimes include non-whites on the basis of their longevity or their patriotism to the cause of protecting the settlement. 
So together, these points, I hope, show that the replacement theory explains the unease, the affect of the current moment experienced by many in the face of the refugee crisis. But it, it also offers a solution with a justification. Reclaim and protect the settlements, the origin stories, in the name of community and economic stability. So let me return to the question I posed earlier. Why is group identity of any sort, racial, ethnic, or lineage, relevant to political power and territorial rights, as the replacement theory contends? I want to offer two different lines of argument that offer support for this claim from Hector Saint-Jean de Crevecoeur and Thomas Jefferson. Neither are the sort of political theorists we generally turn to today to think through issues of sovereignty or group rights to territory. But I'd suggest they help reveal the ideas that circulate even today in spheres of discourse that motivate the reactionary movements. And importantly, both emerged during the period of the founding of the United States Republic, and thus during the formative period of democratic governments in what is now called the West. The forms of democracy that emerged in this period are identified by some political theorists, such as Joel Olson, as Heron Volk uh, democracies. I know I'm mispronouncing that. <laughs> in which whiteness was a significant form of social power. The United States was founded with ideas opposed to monarchies and aristocracies, but also to the colonialism of the British Empire. In regard to the latter, nativism was a useful idea. That is, a privileging of a certain group of cohabitants of the land based on their ethno-racial identity. So this was key to, to their claims of self-government. The first line of argument comes from a farmer, Hector Saint-Jean de Crevecoeur, who published a book that became a bestseller in 1782 in the midst of the Revolutionary War against British rule. The book was entitled Letters from an American Farmer. Crevecoeur, who was called the farmer of feelings, described farm life at the frontier from the perspective of a recent immigrant from Europe who finds a new world of great beauty and potential for bucolic harmony, even with the stress of living on the frontier with unpredictable neighbors. This new world demanded an ability to adapt and learn rather than simply repeat the traditions from home. The book is written in ep epistolary form as a collection of 12 letters in which Crevecoeur shares his observations of frontier life. He includes such topics as the unfamiliar wildlife he encounters and the specific agricultural challenges posed by the American terrain. But he also engages in some acute social analysis of how this experience of settling new lands affected the political subjectivity of the immigrants. The letter entitled, What is an American? offers a definition that is viewed today as a founding document of a multi-ethnic white American identity, that is, the melting pot in which diverse European nationalities became a singular group defined as white Americans. Note that Crevecoeur's epistle was written during a period of feverish debate over whether alternatives to monarchy were even feasible. Crevecoeur answered this question thusly. Democracy, he said, is possible for this particular group of people under these particular conditions. Crevecoeur defined the American people as those who had immigrated voluntarily from Europe, even if the voluntary nature of this migration contained some elements of economic and political coercion. But Crevecoeur argued that if this it is this group who are in a unique condition to launch the democratic experiment with some promise of success because they were arriving unencumbered and fresh, seeking refuge from a variety of miseries and wants, he said, inflicted by their countries of origin. Thus, they were motivated to dispense with their prior allegiances and invent new forms of identity and social interaction. He describes their outlook as follows. He says, quote, we are nothing but 
what we derive from the air we breathe, the climate we inhabit, the government we obey, the system of religion we profess, and the nature of our employment." Unquote. In this way, he imagined that their innate human capacity for self-creation, both as individuals and as a collective, could develop in the new world without hindrance by the demand to follow tradition or honor their connection to any other group. Such an immigrant, Crevaker surmises, quote, must greatly rejoice that he lived at a time to see this fair country discovered and settled. He must necessarily feel a share of national pride when he views the chain of settlements which embellish, embellishes these extended shores, unquote. Crevaker felt such national pride to be both natural and justifiable as he exclaims, quote, there never was a people situated as they are who with so ungrateful a soil have done more in so short a time, unquote. So this is, of course, John Locke's labor theory of, of value at work. Those who mix their toil with the land have the right of it. Thus, the practice of settling produces agricultural communities whose territorial claims outrank those groups seen as hunter-gatherers. And thus today, minoritized groups in the United States, notably African-Americans, Asian-Americans, and Latinos, make claims at times about their, our longevity in labor and constructing infrastructure, railroads, agriculture as a basis for political rights. Thus was set out the basic creed of American exceptionalism, still with us today, and regularly extolled by liberal political leaders such as Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Americans, meaning here European Americans, are an exceptional people precisely because they have freely immigrated and chosen to leave old Europe behind with its irrational distinctions of rank that control social interaction and stymie creativity. Voluntary migration is a willful choice of self-renewal. We are nothing but, Crevaker says, signaling a presentist approach that foregrounds volitional commitments and effortful labor. Our particular histories no longer have meaning. All that counts is what we in the present choose to do here, whom we choose to obey, and what ideas we choose to profess. Of course, most European migrants to the Americas had been starved and driven out of their countries. As Crevaker describes with some phenomenological insight, the new immigrant, quote, is arrived on a new continent. A modern society itself offers it to it his contemplation, different from what he had hitherto seen. It is not composed as in Europe of great lords who possess everything and of a herd of people who have nothing. Here are no aristocratical families, no courts, no kings, no bishops, no ecclesiastical dominion, no invisible power giving to a few a very visible one, no great manufacturers employing thousands, no great refinements of luxury. The rich and the poor are not so far removed from each other as they are in Europe. Remember, he's writing this around 1782. This is the enduring myth of American class mobility and democracy, a myth taken up in recent years by some immigrants from the global south. The first several generations of white immigrants tended to intermarry across ethnic lines and not to hy hyphenate their new identities or name themselves English American or French American. They were happy with a replacement term, American. They hoped for a new social world where they might achieve a new standing with more social equality. There's a sense of logic to Crevaker's claims, despite the partial nature of his picture of the formation of the settler society. He helps us see an aspect of the group experience that founds white identity even today. The point of view he describes, however, may not in fact have ranged equally across differences of property so much as Crevaker imagined. <clears throat> 
The elites who led the new nation continued to pull rank with each other by the conventions of old Europe and hounded those like Alexander Hamilton, who was a recent immigrant with a modest family lineage. The mass of European Americans, however, were no doubt happy to leave such manners of judgment behind. It's not what you are, but what you do. Crevecoeur provides a description of a key aspect of the white imaginary here, the mythic signing of the social contract that united the new immigrants into a co cohesive nation. Being white was a key element. By the 1800s, the poorest indentured Irish laborer could achieve freedom of employment after paying off their debt for the transport, usually within seven years. And homestead laws encouraged landless European immigrants to acquire property, allowing petitions for up to 160 acres. I haven't figured out what that translates into kilometers, but I can figure that out. The state ensured that whites were given political and economic advantages to create new lives for themselves. Some groups who came to the New World had different experiences, such as kidnapping and slavery, and then being left in a society which sanctioned racist violence against them. This motivated them to have a different relationship to their group histories after having been torn from their societies unwillingly. But these were not included in Crevecoeur's description, nor were those who might have other grievances against the new United States government, such as the original natives or later displaced Mexican citizens who were stripped of, right, stripped of rights and forced into peonage after 1848. Crevecoeur defines what it means to be an American as an outlook, an attitude, a motivation. Non-whites are not as American by this definition as white people because of the different and involuntary ways they came to be a part of the nation. Non-Europeans were not always willing or able to set the history of slavery and colonization aside since its effects were ongoing in their present. And they would never have the same emotional relationship to the forming of the United States, never seeing it as the salvation as white immigrants could, never feeling the same patriotism or loyalty to the same extent or in the same way. As the former slave Frederick Douglass put it, referencing the day the country celebrates its founding, <laughs> Douglass asks, what is the 4th of July to me? Patriotism calls for loyalty to the nation that tore their families apart or bombed their home countries. Yet many immigrant groups today do have loyalty to the US state since their families were allied with the US and Southeast Asia, Central America, the Caribbean, Iraq, and elsewhere. <coughs> Some of these newer immigrants come to the US with a similar outlook as the early Europeans, ready to invent themselves anew. In some ways, Crevecoeur's is an epistemic argument. The possibility of democratic deliberation over the common good is the result of the particular condition of European immigration. So this is the first line of argument, that group identity secures rights to sovereignty because of a particular historical experience. For Crevecoeur, the daring experiment in democratic self-government is possible for this group, and perhaps this group alone, because it is free to deliberate without any other ties of allegiance or traditions that merit their respect. Their reasoning is open-ended, unlike others who may share the territory, who reason from grievance or retain multiple loyalties, who have not experienced the empowered self-transformation of the first settlers. A democracy that includes them, as we'll see Jefferson arguing, is simply not possible. So Thomas Jefferson was the third president of the United States, and he played as an, an important role in the actual crafting of democracy and took a radical anti-colonial position that warns of the powers of the rich, of the church, of the dogmas of the schoolmen, and men on horseback, all of which could undermine, he thought, the quest for a feasible system of self-rule. <clears throat> 
Jefferson was not a farmer in the way that Crevacher was. He was a landowner and a slaver who owned 600 slaves over his lifetime. And it was these slaves and their overseers who did the actual farming. During the Revolutionary War, when some escaped slaves chose to fight on the side of the British, having been promised their freedom, Jefferson chose, after they were captured, to return them to their owners after selecting one to give to his wife. But he was also critical of slavery. He described it as an abomination and argued for a process of gradual emancipation. His point of view is instructive and offers a contrasting version of the grounds of nationalism than Crevacher's. In 1780, Jefferson began work on his notes on the state of Virginia in response to a request by the Constitutional Congress for information about the various states. It is in this text full that he, um, he gives lots of descriptions of the rivers, arable land, and peoples of Virginia that we find Jefferson's views about the local indigenous population, about African peoples, and the central rationale of an American polity based upon charters, constitutions, and the laws of the state. It was a text that Jefferson wrote actually as a private document. He didn't intend it to be published, so a lot of historians take what he says in this text to represent Therefore, his sincere and unedited opinions. Jefferson predicted that the slave system that was already dividing the nation in its formative years would soon end. He had already acknowledged in both his speeches and in other writing that slavery was morally wrong. Despite his multi-year relationship with Sally Hemings, one of his slaves, the true nature of which we can only guess at, Jefferson's writings clearly indicate that he believed black people to be intellectually, morally, and aesthetically inferior, and that this was fixed in nature. And this surely motivated his concern that the end of slavery would create a political crisis that could only be solved by the forced return of African peoples to Africa. Why? Jefferson wrote that, quote, the two races equally free cannot live in the same government." Unquote. Note that he doesn't say they must not cohabit the same nation, but that they cannot. In Jefferson's view, the thousand recollections of grievance by former slaves after ab abolition quote, will lead to convulsions which will probably never end but in the extermination of one or the other race. Unquote. Such a conglomeration of peoples with such disparate historical experiences of the nation simply could not reconvene a new democratic polity. Slaves were, after all, enslaved by law, and their inability to petition against beatings and rape and forced separation of their families during slavery was also sanctioned by the laws at the federal level, not merely the state level. For Jefferson, the legitimacy of the grievances that slaves have is precisely what makes it impossible to give them citizenship. He does not claim that the grievances of former slaves are imagined or based in resentment or manufactured by opportunist leaders, the sorts of arguments often used today against minority group claims. Yet former slaves, he thinks, will not be able to share power with whites or cooperate in the task of collective self-invention and deliberation over shared common concerns. Like Crevacur, then, Jefferson holds the view that democracy is feasible only under certain conditions. Jefferson does not consider the possibility that the grievances of the formerly enslaved may not be aimed at all white settlers or all equally. Those indentured servants, landless tenant farmers, those who did not serve as functionaries of the slave system are not considered in his analysis. The grievance he discusses is a grievance against the United States as a constituted political entity. And of course, this is a grievance that today many invaded nations around the world, particularly in Latin America and Southeast Asia, might hold just as intensely. Thus, Jefferson's arguments about slavery would be analogous to other colonizer-colonized relationships. 
Recall that for Crevacur, the grievances of European immigrants are against past injustice in former countries, and thus politically meaningless because they target governments they no longer reside in. It is noticeable that Jefferson does not explore the obligations the nation may owe to the formerly enslaved other than to pay their passage back to the continent of Africa, though he's surely aware that many will not know which precise location would count as a return. He maintains without discussion the right of European settlers to create new political constitutions that encompasses the North American lands they have claimed. I suggest this makes his reasoning more of a tribal form of territorial claim than Crevacur gave. European settlers hold this land until or unless another group might unseat them. It is not their condition as immigrants, but their unity and power as settlers that confers this right. Note also that both of these figures center history in their accounts of the possibility of democracy, and both focus on feasibility conditions. Historical events and not just well-organized institutions set the stage for the success of democracy or its failure. If historical grievances can be set aside, either by voluntary migration or forced return, a substantive deliberative democracy can unfold. Their approaches center questions of feasibility rather than justice, which makes sense since it was the feasibility of democracy that was primarily subject to debate at the time that they wrote. So it is not the superiority of white racial identity in and of itself, but the historical experience of this particular class of whites in relation to non-whites. So finally, now, in the little time that remains, I have the largest question, how do we respond? One thing this tour through early writings makes clear is why it is that in the current moment, in the United States, it is our founding history that's most under contestation. Our national history has been mythologized to portray colonization and slavery as bit players. And the effort to bring it now to the fore, as with the 1619 project, which dates the founding of the Republic with the first slave ships that set the economy in motion, is what has led to laws now in 14 states prohibiting the teaching of critical race theory, which, is, which would make racism um, more of a central feature of the founding of the nation. The historical narrative of the white majority, the ground of its identity, is in crisis. And so I want to suggest the crisis of white identity is a narrative crisis with implications for territorial rights and nation state legitimation. Such crises are besetting all settler states with white majorities, but it's also besetting Europe as well whose wealth and economic stability is so obviously linked to the history of colonization, which has its own chorus of grievous critics. Today's nationalist narrative legitimate resource hoarding and border control on the basis of the right to autonomy or self-determination. So it's a sovereignty built on the inner energy of the ethnic, racial, or religious uniformity. The result of Crevacur's explanation of the feasibility conditions for democracy and Jefferson's prediction of the ineradicable disharmony that slavery's abolition would produce was that the political culture of the United States never set itself the agenda of creating a nation that could unite groups with such disparate experiences and histories. We have never had a political culture that set itself the task of acknowledging these divergent histories and developing reparative policies, with the brief exception of Reconstruction. We have never had a political class that took on the task of negotiating the legacy of racial and colonial injustices in the nation's history. We have never had a state that understood itself as in need of moral reform. So the project of creating not simply a multicultural and multi-ethnic nation with some sphere of protections for minorities, 
But a nation that acknowledges that many millions of citizens have legitimate grievances against the state itself, as well as some portions of the population who continue to benefit from ill-gotten gains, has not been on the agenda. And I suspect this is because there is widespread Jeffersonian skepticism that such an agenda could ever succeed without tearing the nation apart. Hence, we have a public culture that attempts to sever its ties to the past or reframe our history in ways that neutralize its threat. So we must begin where Jefferson refuses to go, to imagine the possibility of a democracy that is racially inclusive, but more than that, inclusive of the formerly enslaved, the aggrieved victims of the majority, those whose land and children were stolen. This was the task he found unthinkable. White nationalists take territorial rights to be inherited, but this is a common view around the world. They want continuation without disruption, which is understandable but impossible in the world today, no matter the political leadership. The replacement theory offers a narrative that connects with Jefferson's approach. Whites will lose everything. Democracy will fail. They will always hate us. They will not have our back. The widely used slogan in the United States today is, no Trump, no America. There's a young philosopher in the United States, Olifemi Otaiwo, whose family is Yoruba from Nigeria and who articulates the idea of choosing your ancestors. In his culture, and he grew up in Ohio of all places, but in an immigrant community, he says, quote, our ancestors are still with us. He says, they put demands on us and steer us toward what we need. Taiwo explains that when speaking to an older person in the Yoruba language, one uses plural pronouns. And this seems to him a way of symbolizing the idea that one speak, when one speaks to an elder, one is speaking to history and all its attendant accumulations. Those accumulations consist simply in all that we see and know in the present. Not only the physical infrastructure of the world, but our ways of life, our forms of interaction, our ways of being. Although there's no choice in regard to the impact of history or its legacy, there is a choice, Taiwo argues, in regard to who we honor and who we follow. Our predecessors did not all agree, and most all of us in the world have an inheritance that includes moral efforts as well as atrocities. But we all have forebears who intended to contribute to a positive change that would not be met in their lifetime, who reached out across time and space to plant seeds that might bear fruit. In the present moment, we are in conversation with our forebears and with our own descendants to decide which path to follow, whose outlook to accept. The truth is that the replacement theory does not represent all whites. It does not represent those who intermarried, who joined native tribes, more than you often think, and who made peace with their neighbors, who refused to kill Vietnamese, who tried to stop the invasion of Afghanistan even after 9-11, who voted against Trump or Orban or Le Pen. The crisis of the historical narrative of whiteness will not be solved with a coherent story of alternative positivity, but with a clear-eyed statement of the choice history has left in our laps. Thank you.